Hi and welcome back to another calculus video. Um, this is the third video in a series about limits. Um, we'll be discussing limits that are approaching positive and negative infinity. So in other words, as the x value that you're putting into a function gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what's the behavior of the y values? That Remember, a limit, we said, is what is y trying to become? So as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what is y trying to become? And sometimes y is trying to become a set value. Sometimes y just kind of goes off and does its own thing, and we say that maybe y is approaching either positive or negative infinity. So let's take a look at a couple of functions and um, see what we can see. So first off, we're going to consider this function here, 3x squared over x squared minus 4. And uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to plug it into our graphing calculator. So let's go ahead and get that out. And when I look at this graphing calculator, I've put it into my y equals screen. I've graphed it. And um, before I look at the graph too much more, um, I want to look at our table. So if I go to my table value, um, and the question is, as x is approaching positive infinity, um, what is happening to y? If that's what we want to know, then we want to look as x is getting bigger and bigger on the positive side. So looking at my table the way that it is, isn't going to be that terribly helpful. So I'm going to go into my table settings. So I'm going to hit second and then the window button. And I can change my table to start wherever. Now, I want to look at where x is approaching infinity. So I'm going to start off kind of on the bigger side. And I'm going to say I want my table to start at 100. And I'm going to go up by ones. And so now I'm going to look at my table. And I'm going to see what's happening around 100. And um, we want to kind of make a table here. So I'm going to put some x and y values down, and I'm going to say, well, when x is 100, what is y? Well, y is 3.0012. And now I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to look at some other table values. I'm going to go ahead and change my table setting. And this time, maybe I want to look at like 500 and see what's happening there. And I'm still going to go up by ones just this time around. Let's see. Oh, look at that. When x was 500, my y value was 3. And did you see all those 3s that were floating around in there? Now, what's happening is when I plug those numbers in and evaluate, if I were to plug in the number 500 and say 3 times 500 squared, the problem is I'm not going to get, let's see, I'm not going to get uh, exactly 3. So you can see I actually get 3.00, but basically what happens is you run out of room in that little table in your graphing calculator, and it says, ah, it's close enough, and it's rounding the value. And I would wager that if we kept on going and we plugged in 1,000 and we plugged in more and more values, that our table in our graphing calculator would still say 3, but when we plug it in on our screen, we would get 3 and then a smattering of decimals. So what's happening is on the positive side, the y value wants to become 3. It's approaching 3. And it's approaching 3 from above. Because what's happening is this value is higher than 3. And the further down I get on that right side, it's getting smaller and smaller. But it's coming from numbers that are above 3 going down to 3, if you can think of it that way. So now let's look at the other side when we approach negative infinity. So for here, I'm just going to go to my table. I'm going to go to my table settings, and I'm going to type in, like, negative 100. And let's see what happens there. So let's see. When we look at our table at negative 100, oh, look, 3.0012. The same thing is happening. We get the same value, whether it's negative 100 or positive 100. So now let's go ahead and jump down to 500. We'll just take a look there just to make sure we're covering our bases. In my table, the same thing is happening. And if I were to go back and um, plug in, you know, negative 500, you know, like you do, you can use the insert button to put some parentheses around there and insert a negative value. Let's see, we'll put parentheses around that negative. Anytime you square a negative uh, in here, you want to make sure that you have parentheses around it so you don't accidentally get a negative number when you go to square it. Otherwise, your calculator will do the negative at the end instead of in the beginning. And so you'll see we got the same value. So the same thing is happening, but this time it's on the left side. So as x is going to that left side, 
the function comes down and it approaches it from above. So now let's take a look at the graph. And for this one, I'm actually going to use Desmos. It's a little bit easier to zoom in and out of, but this is the graph of this function. And uh, you can see, as we look at the graph, if I zoom way, way out, you can kind of see what's happening on either end. As x is approaching 100, you can see that the graph is, in fact, coming down from above and approaching that 3 value. And on the left side, as x is approaching those negative values, it's coming down and approaching 3 from above. And so what we have here is we have, you might know it as a horizontal asymptote. And we say that the limit of this function, the limit, and we'll call the function f of x, as x approaches infinity is 3. And we'll also note that the limit of f of x as x approaches negative infinity is also 3. Now, the fact that these are the same values for this function doesn't mean much for me um, because what we, what we need to have a horizontal asymptote is we only need one side or the other. And sometimes when we approach negative infinity or positive infinity, we get different values, which would indicate we might have two horizontal asymptotes. So we have a horizontal asymptote at the line y equals 3. And what we've just done here is we've established the definition of a horizontal asymptote. Now, remember, you have been taught that asymptotes, possibly, you've been taught that asymptotes are invisible lines that my function will never cross or never touch. And that's simply not true. A horizontal asymptote is simply a value that my y's are approaching as x is approaching either positive or negative infinity. That is the true definition of a horizontal asymptote. So let's keep on going, and we're going to see a couple more examples here. And this is something that you want to get down into your notes. Um, when a limit approaching positive or negative infinity approaches a value, so in this example above, we approach 3. By definition, that value is where a horizontal asymptote lies. So this is the official definition of a horizontal asymptote that you are going to want to get down. The line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote of the graph of a function y equals f of x if either you don't need both, you need one or the other, sometimes it's both, if on either side the limit approaching either positive infinity or negative infinity is equal to that value b. Now, if they approach infinity, if they don't approach a number, then there is no horizontal asymptote. So it's possible that the limit approaching positive or negative infinity either doesn't exist or is an infinity itself, and we will see some of that. Um, then you would say there's no horizontal asymptote because we know not every function has a horizontal asymptote. So when that happens, um, you know, when it approaches a number, there's a horizontal asymptote. When it doesn't, there is none. So one of the AP exam tips that I have for you is to know your definitions. So, for example, on an AP exam free response question, um, if you are asked if a horizontal asymptote exists or if you are asked um, or if you are told that something has a horizontal asymptote at 3, and then you are asked about the limit. Maybe you don't have a picture of the function. Maybe you're just told that it has a horizontal asymptote at 3, and then you're asked about the limit approaching either positive or negative infinity. You might be able to use this definition to justify an answer and say that the limit approaching positive infinity is 3, or something along those lines. So knowing your definitions on the AP exam is going to be um, very helpful. And stating your definitions just so is something that we need to make sure we're practicing. And so when I return a paper to you, if you're one of my students, and I tell you, you need to word it this way, you need to take my advice and practice wording it in such a way that your AP exam readers can read it, know you understand your definitions, and move on. Because there have been times when I've been grading AP exams and I haven't been able to give full credit because the definition wasn't stated in a way that was, uh, you know, succinct or, or explicit enough. It, it opened it up to some, you know, ambiguity. Ah, do you mean this or do you mean this? So we want to make sure we're stating our answers for our AP exam questions in just such a way that we are explicitly stating a definition or giving the information that we need to give to justify our answer correctly. Now. Uh, I want to be clear, you know, I'm not taking points away from students who uh, don't word it a certain way. It's just that their choice of wording opened it up to being interpreted in multiple ways. And to give credit, you need to make sure that it is, boom, here's your answer. So let's talk a little bit more about horizontal asymptotes and finding limits approaching infinity, what we call analytically. Analytically means using algebra. It means not looking at the graph. So this word here, no graph. Now, 
Let's look at this example again. We said that the limit uh, approaching infinity and negative infinity for this graph was 3. And we said that it has a horizontal asymptote at 3 because of that definition. Now, let's take a look at what, you know, what we're going to do moving forward in terms of like finding those horizontal asymptotes. And what we're going to talk about now is something called an end behavior model. Now, the concept of an end behavior model says that if I have a function that is complicated or complex, like for example, f of x here that's on our screen, I can use what's called an end behavior model to mimic the end behavior of this function. And what we do is we understand that as x is getting bigger and bigger, so the numbers that I'm plugging in for the x's are getting bigger and bigger, and we're approaching either a positive or a negative infinity, but it becomes a ginormous number. The idea of an end behavior says that it, it's not affected, the function is less and less affected by things like minus 4 or minus 2x, even if it's just an x. An x squared is going to take over the behavior of the function because when you square an infinity, it's even bigger than the infinity itself. So the idea of an end behavior model says that the biggest terms, especially in a polynomial, um, will impact the end behavior and take over the behavior of the function as x is approaching either positive or negative infinity. So essentially, when we have a function like this, um, a polynomial, over a polynomial, polynomials are easy, easy. And most often, it's polynomials that you're asked to find end behavior models for on my exams and the AP exam. Occasionally, we'll have a tougher one, and in the homework, you might come across that. But for the most part, end behavior models are generally applied towards polynomials. And the idea is we just use that leading term, that term with the largest exponent. So an end behavior model would be something like g of x equals 3x squared over x squared. This would be the end behavior model for f of x. Now, if we simplify this, check it out. The x squareds go away. g of x is 3. You guys, this is the end behavior model. So it's a horizontal line, and sure enough, that end behavior model tells me my limit. So the idea here is that if we have a limit approaching positive or negative infinity, so the limit of the function f of x as x approaches either positive or negative infinity is the same as the limit as x is approaching positive or negative infinity of g of x, where g of x is an end behavior model. So what's the end behavior of y equals 3? It's just 3. So here we would just say, oh, it's 3. So that's a nice, easy way, if you don't have a graph, we use what's called an end behavior model. And again, it has to do with that idea that as we're approaching infinity, all the smaller terms have less of an impact on the overall happening of the function on the ends. So if we use the largest term in the numerator, put it over the largest term in the denominator, that creates my end behavior model when I have polynomials. Now, when I don't have a polynomial, we'll have to talk about that, because those functions we kind of deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's take a look here, and um, we're going to see some more end behavior models. So we want to identify horizontal asymptotes. Anytime you're asked to identify horizontal asymptotes, you are being asked to find an end behavior model and evaluate the limit. So essentially, that's what we want to be able to doing here uh, with this example. Now. I don't have a graph to look at. I'm going to verify it graphically later on. But let's take a look at what's happening here. Now, we said an end behavior model takes the largest term or the leading term or the term with the largest exponent from the numerator and pairs it with the term with the largest term in the denominator. So when I look at this, I'm thrown off by this little radical in here. But I'm still going to consider what's going on with the x and the square root of x squared. And so my end behavior model is simply y equals x over the square root of x squared. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Because the square root of x squared, we have to remember it's not just x. We learned a while back that the square root of x squared is actually the absolute value of x, which can be expressed as a piecewise function. So it's x over the absolute value of x. Now, I can't just go dividing here, because sometimes x is going to be positive, and sometimes x is going to be negative. So here's where I'm going to evaluate the limit of this end behavior model. So I'm going to say the limit as x is approaching positive infinity of x over the square root of x. Now, when I have a positive infinity and a positive infinity, 
I have a positive number up here, and I have a positive number down here, and it's the same number. It's x and x. So what's going to happen is those absolute value bars become redundant. So technically, I can't put infinity over infinity because that's an indeterminate form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze my way through it by saying, well, this is positive, and so is the, num or the denominator. So I'm going to write this limit like this. As x approaches positive infinity of x over x, and I'm going to reduce it before I evaluate the limit. Technically, that's what I'm doing. Now, you could probably jump to this and say, oh, it's just 1. And that would be fine. But I want to make sure you see the thought process so that in the future, if you encounter a problem that's more tricky, you can apply the same thought process. Now, let's evaluate the limit approaching negative infinity. Now, when I have negative infinity, what's going to happen is I'm going to have the same number over the same number. The trouble is the numerator is going to go negative and the denominator is going to turn positive. So what's going to happen here is as I approach a negative infinity and I'm plugging in negative numbers, I'm going to end up with negative 1 on the left side. So this function actually has two horizontal asymptotes. It has one on the right side where my function is approaching 1, and it has one on the left side where my function is approaching negative 1. So my two horizontal asymptotes, and I'll abbreviate horizontal asymptotes, are at y equals 1 and y equals negative 1. Now, we want to take a look at the graph and verify graphically. So let's see what that looks like when we go and we take a look at the graph. So when I graph the function, um, I can see very clearly that on the right-hand side, as I'm approaching a positive infinity, we can see that, yes, indeed, we have a horizontal asymptote right here at 1. I'm a little zoomed in on my window. Um, and then on the left-hand side, as we approach negative infinity, there we are at negative 1. So we can see it very clearly on the graph, um, but analytically we can get that exact value. And there are times when looking at the graph is going to be sufficient, uh, but most of the time finding those limits analytically without a graph is going to be the way to go. And the reason why is because as much as we can rely on the graph to kind of confirm our answers, pulling them off of the graph isn't the greatest, because what if that limit was actually like, what if the uh, asymptote was like 1.1? We wouldn't get that from the graph necessarily. Um, so finding the exact value sometimes from the graph is tricky. Same thing if you're looking at the table, you could also zoom out like we did in the beginning and look at those table values. But again, you would be approaching the number and you'd have a pretty good guess, but analytically, we can nail it down. So that's kind of the best way to go. So let's take a look at uh, this next one. It says, find the limit as x approaches infinity of sine x over x. So we learned a little bit about this guy uh, in a previous lesson. We said that the limit as x approaches 0 of this function was 1. And we established that limit, and we said, now you don't have to prove it. You've got that. When you see that, you know it's 1. You can just use that information. Now let's talk about when x is approaching infinity. And when we look at this one, um, sometimes graphically is the only way we're able to do it. So let's take a look. Now in my graphing calculator, here is the graph of this function, and the limit approaching 0 is in fact 1, but now we want the limit approaching positive infinity. And it looks like positive and negative infinity both have the same limit, and if you were to guess, what might you guess? Maybe you're looking at that and thinking, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe there's 1, maybe we just need to zoom out. Um, it's kind of bouncing around 0, but you can see that it crossed 0 and it touched 0. And here's evidence, again, that a horizontal asymptote is not an invisible line that you never cross or never touch. Remember, it's the limit as x is approaching either a positive or a negative infinity. So graphically, it looks like 0, but let's see if there's an analytical way that we can approach this. And what we're going to talk about right now is something called the sandwich theorem. Now, the sandwich theorem has shown up on the AP exam a couple of times in the past. Usually there's been like maybe one or two questions regarding it. Um, it also goes by a couple other names, the squeeze theorem or the pinch theorem. Uh, that one I don't hear very often, but sandwich and squeeze are the same, uh, same very common names for this theorem. And the idea is when we have a tricky limit, if we can take that function and sandwich it between two functions that we know the limit of, and we can squeeze it down, and we know maybe the limit of this function is 1, and the limit of the bottom function is 1, 
And if we can establish that and say that, hey, my function that I don't know about is always going to stay between those two functions, if we know the top limit and the bottom limit, those act like the bread in our sandwich. And if we know they're both one, well, then the inside of my sandwich must also be one. But the problem is we have to establish that, number one, the function I want to know about is always between the other two. That's step one. And then step two, we have to establish that the other two, my bread, are always going to have the same limit um, or are going to have the same limit. So there are two conditions we need to meet. So this would be what we want to jot, jot down here. So this is the actual theorem. If g of x is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to h of x. So this is the one from the problem. g and h I have to come up with. Those, I, I, the, I'm responsible for those. On some open interval containing x equals c, except possibly at x equals c itself. And then if, now here's where it says, the limit of the ones I pick are the same, then the one in the problem also has the same limit. So let's talk about this sine x over s and how we are going to establish using it. So sine f of x is sine x over x. Now I need to come up with a g of x and an h of x that are both greater than and less than. Now let's talk about sine. I like using the sandwich theorem when I have trigonometric functions because sine and cosine they're always bouncing around between two values. And maybe you might remember that when you think about the graph of sine, sine starts at 0, 0. It goes up, down, up, down. And the amplitude of a sine curve and a cosine curve generally is 1, unless there's some sort of multiplier in there that's changed the amplitude. So if you remember that sine is always going to be between 1 and negative 1. Then I know that the numerator, if I just leave the denominator the same, I'm going to let one of my functions be negative 1 over x and the other function be positive 1 over x. And so what I have to do to use the sandwich theorem is I have to say, step one, I have to say that here are my two functions. I have to establish that the one in the problem is always going to be between the two that I pick. And again, I picked this. If I leave the denominator the same and my numerator is always going to go back and forth between positive and negative 1, then this should make sense. You have to state the inequality saying my function in question is between the two that I'm picking. Then step 2 is the limits. Step 2 says do the limit of each one. The limit as x approaches infinity of negative 1 over x is zero. Think about that. Negative one divided by a bigger and bigger number. Anytime you're dividing by infinity, it's going to be zero. That value is approaching zero. And also the limit as x approaches infinity of positive one over x is also zero. Then we say, therefore, by the sandwich theorem, the limit of my function is also zero. And you can name it f of x, provided that you've established that naming convention somewhere in your problem. So you can't just say f of x unless it's called f of x somewhere in the problem. So this is your, these are your steps. Step one, establish the inequality that says your function is sandwiched between two others. Step two, do the limits of the two you've chosen. And then say, therefore, by the sandwich theorem, my limit must also be zero. Um, so let's take a look and see if we can try another problem here and maybe um, maybe you want to pause the video and give it a try because check it out we've got this sandwich theorem we've got another sine function so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can decide what would be the two functions that you would use to apply the sandwich theorem here so again I hope that you're remembering that your sign is always going to be between positive and negative one so the two functions that I would use would just be to say negative x squared is between my function and positive x squared. And so if we're sandwiching between those, we know that sine will always be a value between 1 and negative 1. So it will always bounce back and forth. And all I did was take this part of the function and turn it into a negative 1 or a positive 1. That's essentially what I'm doing here to apply the sandwich theorem. 
And so this is a nice trick when we have uh, sine functions. I, I like using the sandwich theorem on sine functions and things like that. So now we're gonna, we've established the inequality, consider, and then you can say since, remember we're, we're essentially writing a proof. Now step two is the limits, right? The limit as x approaches zero uh, of negative x squared equals zero, and the limit as x approaches zero of positive x squared is zero. Therefore, by the sandwich theorem, the limit of x squared sine of one over x as x approaches zero must also be zero. Now, the reason we had to use the sandwich theorem here is because uh, when we're trying to find the sine of one over zero, uh, that's infinity, uh, the sine of infinity, uh, it's just bouncing around, right? So when you have an oscillating function like that, um, using the sandwich theorem is a really handy little trick. So we've got a couple more practice problems. I think I have three more quick examples, and I would encourage you throughout this next couple of minutes of the video to pause the video and try these on your own. So example five, um, try to find this limit, and remember, algebraic manipulation is your friend. So with uh, example five here, remember, we like to split things up when we're evaluating limits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as two limits. The limit as x approaches infinity of 5x over x plus the limit as x approaches infinity of sine x over x. Now I did this because, check it out, I've got this sine of x here and it's over this x and I, I know things about that limit. Like I know that the limit as x approaches infinity of this is, is going to be zero. So check this out. Remember we've got all these properties of limits. Here I'm going to simplify before I evaluate because remember if I have infinity over infinity that's the indeterminate form. It's one of the two. Zero over zero indeterminate form. Can't do anything got to simplify. So the limit of 5 is just 5 plus the limit of this is 0. So the answer here should be 5. And if we look at the graph, uh, we can see that on the graphing calculator. There seems to be a horizontal asymptote right there at 5. So if you got that one, excellent. If you didn't, don't worry. My encouragement to you is always going to be keep on going. Limits can be tricky, especially getting used to the algebraic manipulation. And as a matter of fact, it's not the limits that are tough. It's learning how to recognize when do I need to split a fraction? When do I need to do an end behavior model? When do I need to do all this stuff? So my advice to you is the more you practice, the better you get at recognizing what you want to do. And sometimes you're going to be approached with different strategies and you'll have to try one and fail at it and then go to the next strategy. And that's totally okay. So example six, let's take a look. Example, or identify any horizontal asymptotes or state that they do not exist. As soon as I see horizontal asymptotes, I should think end behavior model because this is a limit as x is approaching positive or negative infinity. And I have to think about both sides. So I'm gonna have to do two limits here. So here we go. The limit as x approaches positive infinity of 4x squared minus 3x plus 5 over 2x cubed plus x minus 1. I'm going to do an end behavior model. I'm going to say the limit of this function is the same as the limit as x approaches infinity. And remember the end behavior model of polynomials over polynomials is the largest term in the numerator and the largest term in the denominator. And then I'm going to simplify that. So 4 over 2... This simplifies to 2 over x. So again, simplify. So the limit approaching infinity, 2 divided by a bigger and bigger, bigger number. Remember, you can't divide by infinity. But you can divide by something really ginormous. So 2 divided by a really ginormous number is just 0. So we must have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Now I'm going to do the other side. I'm going to do it the same exact way. And I'm not going to write all this out. I'm just going to use that end behavior model because it's the same function. So now I'm just thinking about it in a different number. So 2 divided by a really, really negative number um, is still going to be 0, 2 divided by a ginormous number. But think about it this way. 
when x was approaching positive infinity, you were dividing by a really big positive number. So a positive divided by a positive meant we had positive numbers approaching 0. Down here, we've got a positive on top, 2, divided by a really big negative number on the bottom. So we have negative numbers that are getting smaller and smaller. So on the right-hand side, I would expect to be approaching 0 coming down from the positive values of y. And then on the other side, I would expect to see it approaching uh, from coming from below from the negative region. And so let's just pause for a moment and we'll take a quick look at the graph. And there it is. And wouldn't you know it, on the right-hand side, as I'm approaching 0, I'm approaching from positive y values. On the left, I'm approaching from negative. So we can kind of use some analytical thinking there to get a picture of the graph and see what it looks like for its end behavior. Here we go. This will be our last example. So uh, let's walk through it together. Here we've got an absolute value function. And so we want to evaluate the limits approaching positive and negative infinity. And before I do that, let me just make sure that uh, I forgot to identify the horizontal asymptotes in example six. Don't do what I do and forget to sum up your answer. There are uh, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So there we go. Last but not least, part A, find the limit approaching infinity. So we're going to use an end behavior model, but this one, remember, we can't get rid of absolute value until we start to evaluate because that's going to change positive and negative values. So I'm going to find the limit of the end behavior model. And the end behavior model is going to be right there. It's those largest terms, but I have to hang on to the absolute value. And I can't cancel any x's yet. So when I'm plugging in infinities, um, I'm going to get three times some number. Remember, x and x are the same number. It's just the signs are going to be different. So they are going to cancel. But we have to think about positive and negative. So up here, I'm going to have a positive number. And then down here, I'm going to have a positive number. So whatever I'm approaching, it's going to be a positive value. So now that I've established the signs, I'm going to cancel the x's and say that positive 3 sevenths. Now, for part B, I'm going to do much the same thing. I'm going to find that negative infinity limit of 3x over the absolute value of 7x. Now, I can't cancel the x's until I establish the sign. So I'm going to have a negative number up here, but down here it's going to stay positive. So my answer is going to be negative. Now I can cancel the x's, so negative 3 sevenths. So there are two horizontal asymptotes at y equals 3 sevenths and y equals negative 3 sevenths. And if we want to confirm that graphically, we just have to plug it into our calculator and take a look. And so here's a look at the graph. And I did change it to be from 1 to negative 1 on my y-axis. And so you can see right around negative 3 sevenths, right around positive 3 sevenths, that's where my uh, horizontal asymptote lies. And just a quick side note, for my y equals, I had to plug in the absolute value. To get to the absolute value button uh, or option, you hit math, the math key right under the green alpha key, and you go over to the number menu, and it's option number one. That'll insert those absolute value bars for you. So again, I adjusted my window to zoom in, and my y, min, and max are one and negative one. Uh, and yep, there are my two asymptotes. So so we talked about finding the horizontal asymptotes because those are limits approaching infinity. That's the definition of a horizontal asymptote. We also talked about end behavior models and when to use them. Generally, it's when we have a polynomial over a polynomial. And we kind of reviewed some uh, basics about splitting up something, splitting up your function to be able to evaluate limits separately. And if you have a fraction over a single denominator, like we did in example five, that's a strategy that you're going to employ regularly on your AP exam to answer some of these limit questions um, and do some other things as we go along. So hopefully this has been a helpful video for you. Feel free to reach out if you have more questions. Uh, and my encouragement is, you know, don't get bogged down. It's a lot of information. The only way you're going to get good is through practice. So if you're not mastering it right away, don't worry. It's okay. I don't even master things the first time through. So take your time with it. And just know that I'm here for you, and uh, you can do this. You've got this.